Hi, Pudge. So, do you want to tell everybody why we're doing another how-to video today? That's right. Anything else you would like to add? That is also right. So, today we're going to talk about your line. Your line. Soil. Soil. Yeah, good job. Do you want to show them how we make soil? And how we water plant with soil? And how we pot with soil? And do you want to answer some more soil questions? All right, sounds good, let's do it then. Okay, so I wasn't planning to do another how-to video this week, but I injured my wrist and my thumb playing volleyball. You can see it's kind of purple and pink. It's very painful and I probably should have just skipped a YouTube video this week. But here we are. Um, I'm going to show you how I make my soil mix. I thought this would be a good one because it seems like everybody is doing their repotting right now. I haven't really done much spring repotting yet, but I will in the next few weeks. This is actually my old mix and um, I still have a bit left over, so I'm just going to add to it since it's still good. Um, but it is quite, uh, I don't know what the word is, flat, I guess. Like it's not as nutrient rich as I like it to be. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get it mixed in. I'm gonna first start by adding my soil. Um, sorry about the noise. My neighbor upstairs is moving, so she's like moving furniture around and stuff. Um, but what was I going to say? So I'm probably only going to prepare about half of this bin, maybe even a little bit less, just because I don't, I don't want to put too much strain on my left hand today. So, and also Pudge is snoring in the background. So I'm just going to start adding some potting soil. And normally I would just take the entire bag and dump it. But again, my wrist. And the, and the bag is huge. Oh. I actually don't have ratios, which might drive some of you crazy. But I honestly just kind of do what I feel looks right, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, kind of like how you make your coffee. Like, I don't think anyone really measures out how much, like, milk and cream they use and maybe even sugar. You just kind of go by the color and just what you're used to seeing. So, I'm sorry if that's not helpful, but honestly, my wrist is, like, super killing me. And I'm very sore. This was, like, my first real workout since I ran a marathon in... 2013. <laughs> as soon as I crossed that finish line, just never stepped foot into a gym. I never bothered to work out again. I was just done. And don't you even dare think that like, I blazed across that finish line like a boss. I was hobbling. I barely made it. I almost didn't make it to be honest. But you know what? I did. And that's what matters. Okay, so this potting mix is sold as an indoor potting mix. And um, at the store, they're gonna tell you that it's already ready to just go, like you don't need to add anything to it. But as I'm sure, you know, arid growers know, like we like it really nice and chunky. So, I mean, it's fine if you pot your plants in just this. Truth be told, it's, it's not gonna kill your plant. I've done it, but you just wanna be super careful with your watering um, because this will hold on to a lot of moisture. So yeah, just keep that in mind. So I'm just gonna get this soil mixed up with my old soil first before I start adding new amendments. And I'm not wearing a mask because I have to talk, but typically 
I would be wearing a mask right now because there's going to be a lot of kick up and you don't want to be inhaling soil, perlite dust, cocoa husk dusk, dusk, cocoa husk dust, cocoa husk dust, cocoa husk dust. My brain can't process that. Oh my gosh, my wrist. Why do I do these things to myself? There we go. There it is. I was wondering where it was. So what I'll be adding next is Coco Husk. And the one that I'm using is Exoterra brand. And you can just get this at like pet stores and reptile stores. Um, and it's made for like their bedding. The reason that I like this one over mulch is because it's already um, heat treated and machine washed and I don't have to do it. So there's one reason. But honestly, just get whatever's cheapest or whatever you want. And I really wish I was wearing a mask right now because it's dusty. What I'm gonna do is take a a uh, spray bottle and I'm just gonna spray over the cocoa husk to settle um, all of that dust kick up. Okay, now I'm gonna get this one nice and mixed up. And you just wanna kind of pull these fibers apart because they will be kind of clumped together. I will usually add a bit of bark as well, but I I haven't really restocked on my bark in a while, and I found that my plants are kind of okay without it. Um, so I'm just trying to be as like minimal, I guess, now as possible. I just don't really like the idea of um, needing to keep rebuying stuff like that especially when it comes in like such small bags and it's like wrapped in plastic i wish there was a i wish there was like a plant store that you could just like go and bring your own like containers and stuff and they can just refill all the things you need and you don't have to buy them in like big old plastic bags i don't know i just feel like things could be planned out better so that not so much plastic is being used. Anyway, it's just me ranting. Okay, so this looks pretty nice and mixed to me. I don't even know why I bother wearing gloves. The entire <laughs> inside has dirt in it. So the next thing we're gonna add is Lekka. And I like using this just to put some like texture in the soil, to create some air pockets in the soil. I just find that the roots really love when there's like like a mix into it. And then also because it's a natural wicker, um, it's gonna help control how much water kind of sits down towards the bottom. Um, and I just find that this has been such a great addition to my plants, especially in um, containers with no drainage holes. So whether or not it actually does the things that I tell myself it does, I add it because I really like to use it. And if you're wondering, yes, I do sit and pick these pieces of Lekka out before I throw out any soil because that's just, it's just what I do. Don't wanna waste it. You can reuse Lekka for like ever. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll usually just like put a movie on and then just sit there with my gloves and start picking it out. It's not fun, but I mean, it's just what you gotta do. So next I'm gonna be adding my horticultural charcoal and it kind of helps control things like bacteria and yucky stuff that happen underneath the surface of the soil. Um, and I have soaked this 
before um, adding it. I don't know the reason why it needs to be soaked, but I just know that the bag told me to. So that's what I do. And I've heard that if you're using like charcoal that hasn't been rinsed, sometimes it can burn your roots. So better safe than sorry. Next, I'm gonna be adding my sphagnum moss. And the reason that I add this is because it helps um, plants that have been rooted in moss move to soil. And I just find that the success rate, if you watched my last video, it's just a lot higher um, during transfer. So I'm not gonna use a whole lot. Just about like this. Again, I'm gonna just use my bottle I'll wet it just a little bit just because it's super dusty and dry. And I'm gonna just like pull this apart and let it crumble because I don't want really long pieces of fiber in the soil. I just want um, little bits and pieces spread throughout. Okay, getting close here. So now the next thing that I'm gonna add is perlite. And this one has been already pre-washed, so it's not really dusty. And I'm just gonna add this whole bucket. And honestly, I probably would add more, but I was getting really tired washing it, so this is just going to have to do. You can also use um, pumice if you don't want to use perlite. I've just always used perlite, so that's kind of what I stick with. But pumice is really good too. Yeah, so I will probably go in and add a, a lot more perlite um, after when I'm in a better position to be doing that much work. I'm gonna add some of my worm castings just to give it a bit more nutrients. Okay, and the last thing I'm gonna add, and you don't have to do this, but I'm gonna be adding some diatomaceous earth. And it's just a powder like this. And you wanna be wearing a mask when you're handling this as well. And I do this because I feel like it's been helping repel fungus gnats. You are supposed to be using it dry, but all of the soil that I've mixed DE with, like I find that the gnats aren't really um, attracted to them as much as they would be anyway. So this is the final, oh my gosh. So this is the final product and um, I find that my aeroids have been loving this mix like I mentioned, you can use stuff like pumice and vermiculite. You can also add um, fir bark. But yeah, this is kind of like the basis of it and anything extra wouldn't hurt. I'm not doing a ton of like big repotting this year, I don't think besides outdoor plants. Um, but this should be able to get me through all of the plants that I'm gonna be transitioning from moss into soil and I think uh, I think I'll actually show you how I do that. Give me one second. Okay, so off camera, I did rinse more perlite and added it to the soil. And this is about how you want it to look. 
And you can see with each handful, you have a good mix of soil, some um, husk, some leca, a good amount of perlite. And yeah, I just find that this is such a great mix for my aeroids and they've all loved it so far. I honestly, I use it for my cacti, I use it for my succulents, my anthuriums. Um, the only one that I have a very specific mix for is probably the begonias. Um, I don't make that one as like uh, chunky, but everyone else, everyone else gets this. So here I have an Anthurium crystallinum that has developed pretty nice roots in moss. And I do think it's ready for soil. I'm going to add a bit more moss to this mixture just because this one's a newer import and I really don't want to shock it since it's still, still kind of acclimating. So let me show you how I do that. I should also mention that this one was grown without drainage holes and yeah, fruits are great, no rot. Um, just make sure that when you're growing without drainage holes that you're giving your plants enough light and warmth if you're able to so that it can photosynthesize and the roots can actually use the moisture in the moss. And this is what the root system looks like. And honestly, I couldn't be happier. Like this crystallinum acclimated like a dream. These roots happened honestly like overnight. And um, yeah, I'm really happy with how far it's come since it's been imported. This is the old pot. This is the new pot. And I'm just using a clear orchid pot. And you can see there's not a huge size difference, but it will have some space to move around and I'm going to start by just adding a layer of soil down at the bottom that has a lot more moss chunks um, just so those roots don't get as shocked I guess and then I'm going to position the plant in the pot where I want it and I'm basically just going to lightly fill in. And similar to sphagnum moss, if you watched my last how-to video, you don't want to pack too tightly because you want water to be able to travel from the top all the way down into those drainage holes here. Um, and if you pack it too tightly, especially since there's moss in it, there's a chance of it becoming like a solid mass and it'll just end up repelling water. So, so yeah. This is pretty much how I repot a plant from moss into soil and I'm not going to water this one because this soil is already pretty damp and what was that sound? Um, I'm not going to water it because this one is pretty damp and you can see it has a bit of water in it already. So I'll give it a few days, um, maybe in about a week. I'll give it a, a thorough watering and yeah, hopefully it likes life in soil. So here I have my philodendron Paraiso Verde. And if you haven't seen one of these before, they are just beautiful. I love, I love long leaf philodendrons with bunny ears. They're just so cute. Like philodendron Mexicanum, philodendron Billetier, philodendron Atabapoense, and my good boy is coming. Hi buddy, good morning. <laughs> nice of you to join us. Oh, I know, okay. Um, so you can see down at the bottom, the roots have outgrown this pot and I wanna get it repotted before they dry up. So that's what I'm gonna do today. 
and I'm going to be repotting it in this clear container. First things first, I'm going to get it out of this pot. And when I'm repotting, I just try and loosen the soil as much as I can. And if I feel like it kind of can just be dumped out, that's what I'll do. And I do think this one can be. pretty easy so you can see here the roots um, are definitely looking for more space but man these are great looking roots so when I'm repotting my soil plants I just try and be as delicate as I can you just want to like massage slowly and um, just try and prevent as much root breakage as you can. Honestly, if you break secondary roots, it's really not that huge of a deal. And secondary roots are, let's see. So here is a primary root, this big chunky one. And I'm gonna do this without spilling. Secondary roots are these little tiny white ones that are growing out of the big juicy primary one. Wow, my words are such science. Honestly guys, don't take me too seriously. Like, I'm just a hobbyist and I've actually been growing houseplants since about 2000, like 2012. Actually, no, that's wrong. Like 2000, 2010, 2011. And um, I didn't really get into like, like imported or like rare plants or whatever until maybe 2018. So yeah, I'm not like that well seasoned, but I do know a thing or two. Wow. Okay. Now that these roots are like untangled, they're kind of long. Are they gonna fit in that pot? Crud. And you can see that we have a tiny bit of root breakage. Most of them are secondary roots. You can tell by how like small and hairline they are. And there it goes. Um, so yeah, not too bad. So what I have here is LECA that you can see has dirt on it already because it was previously used with another plant that I had in a container with no drainage holes. And I'm not super worried about sterilizing it. I mean, I probably should have given it a reboil, but I only had this in that container for maybe like two weeks until I realized it actually needed a smaller container. So, um, yeah. I know, it's loud in here. I said go to the bedroom. I'll come get you when it's time to go. And I'm gonna do about that much down at the bottom. Okay, so here I have just my regular Aeroid mix. And I don't know if this is gonna, oh my gosh, there's no way this is gonna fit. Nope, nope, not even close. Okay, back to the drawing board. One second, please. I'm back. So this is what I was gonna put it in. And this is what I will put it in. Um, ideally, I would have wanted something like a tiny bit smaller than this one, but it's better than this one. So let's just, yeah, reset.
Sorry, I know it's kind of hard to see with the glare, but I'm just using a regular popsicle stick and I'm just going to push down and fill in all of those gaps. And it's not like super necessary, it's just my preference. And I'll just go around the whole pot doing that. So I'm gonna try and get this little area here where there's like a big pocket. And again, you don't wanna be packing too tight. You just wanna be moving that soil around. So up at the top here, you can either top it with sphagnum moss. What I'm gonna be using is sheet moss. The sheet moss that I buy just looks like this. It comes in a bag. Um, a lot of people think you get this at stores like Michael's, like a craft store. That's different. Um, this I get at a local nursery. It's alive, um, it's sealed, and you can just see how it's different than sphagnum moss. This is sheet moss. Uh, like from the forest floor. There's gonna be like soil and twigs and just a whole bunch of other things in here, but I think it's beautiful. So I usually use this to top my big plants with soil. Wow, it's so fluffy and nice. This is like really good moss. And moss grows in an abundance here in Canada. Um, so I would say to use sheet moss over sphagnum moss if we're talking like sustainability and stuff. So here's a better look at the moss and oh my gosh, I wish you guys could feel this. This is probably one of the nicest moss that I've purchased recently. And please, I hope there's no spiders in here. Um, so what I do is I just top it here. And oh, I was saying I bought this moss for a project that I'll be doing on YouTube as well. Um, I'm gonna be building a moss wall for one of my exoterras. Um, and then I'm gonna be taking a bunch of cuttings and like letting it grow up the wall. And yeah, I'm kind of excited for that one. And I just saw this moss and was like, I fell in love with it. Like it's so beautiful and fluffy. And what I do is I just top it like this. Oh, it's not even in the frame. Good job, Charmaine. And yeah, this is pretty much what I do for a lot of my big container pots. It just like adds a nice touch to it, like when it's on a shelf, it just makes it look more alive and um, green and just like really, it's really aesthetically pleasing when you've got like a wall of it and it's just, yeah, anyway, I'm rambling. So this is the final product. I'm not gonna be watering it because I mentioned earlier the soil is actually still pretty um, damp. So maybe in about a week or so, um, I'll give it a nice, a good drink. But yeah, that's how I pot with no drainage holes. So you might be able to hear the lawnmowers going in the background. I hope it's not too distracting but I do need to finish filming. It's getting kind of late in the day. Um, so here I have a few plants. Um, sorry for the weird angle, it'll make sense in a little bit. Um, I have a Gloriosum here, I've got a green Congo next to it, and then I've got this little teeny tiny succulent guy. I wanna show you how I water my plants with no drainage holes. So I'm gonna do that with this Philodendron Gloriosum since it does need to be watered. It looks like it's dried out quite a bit and I did dry this one out a little bit more for the purpose of this video. So I just have my squeeze bottle here and I'm basically just going to start going around the edges of the pot, squeezing pretty gently. And if you have a good well draining soil, the water should flow pretty freely to the bottom which is why it's important to not be packing your soil too tightly. 
And you basically just wanna water like very intentionally. Don't mind this crazy contraption I've got going here, which I just messed up. Um, I find it like kind of difficult to plant gloriosums because you've got to keep the rhizome over the, the soil. You can bury it a tiny bit, but I try and actually let it crawl along the surface of the soil. I'm gonna have to fix this later, but yeah, basically you just go around and you water, kind of wait a little bit and see how much is actually flowing to the bottom. What you can actually do as well, I have a little pokey stick here. Um, you can just aerate the sides and just be gentle. And you can even aerate the middle area. You don't need to do it too many times. And then just go back in and water. Okay, so once you've got the edges, then you're gonna do the top. You just go across the surface of the soil like this. And I like using these squeeze bottles because of the amount of water that's coming out of the tip. Um, it just allows for more controlled watering. And um, yeah, again, just being really intentional with it. And I'm gonna try and lift this even though I'm injured, but it just looks like this. Um, there's gonna be parts that are a little bit dry, but the LECA kind of helps with water distribution. Um, eventually over time you'll see, maybe I'll try and, um, oh my gosh, my wrist. I'll try and take a video of this tomorrow just to show how the water distributes throughout the soil um, as time goes by, but yeah. So that's how I water it. What I'm gonna do is just grab some soil or grab some moss that's been pre-prepared. And I'm just gonna get it over top. And then what you're gonna do is get some diatomaceous earth and I'm just using the Harris brand and it's food grade. So I find that the easiest way is just using an old um, paintbrush like this and just gently tapping it over the top. And I would be using a mask generally preparing this. I've read, um, I've read some pretty heated discussions online about like how safe it is to be breathing this stuff in. And in conclusion, if you, if you can avoid breathing it in, I don't see why you wouldn't. So just wear a mask and just be careful when you're applying. And yeah, I just go over top like this and you're done. And this is gonna help deter fungus gnats um, because they can get super, super annoying in these containers with no drainage. So topping it with moss and then going over it with DE is like so helpful. We're jumping into the future really quickly. Um, an update on that Gloriosum. It's now been more than 24 hours since I've watered and you can see how different it looks. Um, the water has pretty much evenly distributed throughout the soil and it's just looking really good and saturated. Yesterday, there was about a quarter inch of water pooled down at the bottom, but like I mentioned, Lekka is a powerful wicker, so it has naturally pulled all of that water back up into the soil. So anyway, I hope that was helpful, and now we jump back into the past. Next, I'm going to be working on my green Congo, and what I wanna do is just top it with some moss and apply diatomaceous earth as well. Um, this moss has kind of been sitting out and it's pretty dry, you can hear, you can hear the crunch. So because I'm injured, um, I've chosen to do this setup instead and I, I only do this if I'm doing like a big 
rewatering in my EXO, I just take the top of the automatic spray bottle and I connect the tubing that I use for my, my air pump or is that what it is? Like the air bubbler for propagations. Typically I would just use a long piece of plastic tubing, um, but I didn't have any more. So I had to just string together my shorter pieces using some of the connectors. Um, this part isn't necessary. I just use this for the actual propagation setup. So at the end is this tiny little thing that comes with the water bottle and I just connected it at the end. I stick it in either like a tub or a just a jug like this, and then you just use it as you normally would. It's a lot easier on your hands. You're not needing to hold like that big heavy jug, and you can get a lot of your um, misting done basically just using one jug full, at least for the amount of plants that I have. And what I'm gonna do is actually apply diatomaceous earth um, inside the pot and over the top of the moss. Before I apply the moss, I just want to show you how I check if something needs to be watered that's not in a clear pot. And I'll just use that same pokey stick if it would focus. And I just stick it in one spot. Pull it out and I can actually see and feel that it's a little bit wet but it's not as it's not as wet as I would like it to be so I am gonna water this a tiny bit and since I'm gonna be watering it I'm not gonna use diatomaceous earth on the soil like I originally planned because you have to be using it dry and you can basically do this every time um, the soil dries out or pretty much however much you want to do it. Um, I don't really apply diatomaceous earth as often as maybe one should, but I don't have much of a gnat problem with my plants um, that are on my shelf. My problem with gnats is in the XO where it's really humid and wet. Um, because they thrive in conditions like that. It's like really dry out here, so they kind of hate it, which is nice. And this one's done. So now I'm gonna show you soil that has kind of lost its glow. <laughs> I repotted this um, probably close to six months ago now and I used leftover soil from a plant that came from a nursery because I ran out of soil and I just needed, I needed something. So this one definitely could use a bit of a nutrient boost and some fresh soil. So how you can tell, I'm gonna try and take it out of here. Give me one second. I'm gonna just take this out. I wasn't sure if these were spiky. Um, what I'm gonna do is just poke at the sides to loosen it up. Oh my gosh, my thumb hurts so much. I don't think you can see it, but it's so like red and swollen. I might need to take a week off of Facebook. I mean, Facebook, I'm a mess today. YouTube. I need to take a week off of YouTube after this. Okay, so you can see like how dusty and dry this is. And honestly, I watered this not too long ago. I wanna say I watered it maybe like five days ago. And normally this could hold on to a lot more moisture. Um, if it was like nice and healthy. So you can see it's like dusty and dry and just kind of like, it just looks old. Typically, if you see that your soil has kind of lost that deep black 
um, like nutritious color. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word. Um, and if it dries out really fast or if it starts repelling water, that's kind of a sign that it's, re it's ready for, or it's ready to be replaced. Okay, you guys, Pudge is very, very good at catching things midair. Up, up, up. Okay, ready? We're gonna show them how you catch a treat, okay? Ready? Can you sit down? <laughs> I mean, you're like half sitting down. Your butt's not even on the floor. You wanna show them how you leave it? Down, leave it. Leave it. Okay, go. Pudge, where's the birdie? Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Um, I wanted to answer some soil questions that I got on Instagram, and I thought I would just repot some of my plants at the same time. So if there's anything that I didn't cover by the end of this video, please feel free to leave it in a comment or send me a message on Instagram, and I'd be happy to answer those. Okay, so first question, um, perlite versus vermiculite. There, there is a difference between the two. I wouldn't say that any one is better than another um, because they do two different things. But I'll say that if you're primarily growing aeroids, perlite is probably going to be one that you're gonna use more than vermiculite. Perlite improves aeration. Um, it keeps the soil light when you're using it as a primary amendment. And it really improves drainage and allows for more oxygen to be accessed through the roots. Whereas vermiculite, they're like little tiny sponge pellets and they absorb much more water than perlite. Vermiculite is good for plants that need a damper soil or are just generally more thirsty. If I can think of plants in my own collection that would probably appreciate vermiculite, it would be definitely my scandapsis, my begonias, and probably even my ripsalis. And even though vermiculite has great properties to keep plants like that healthy, my solution is to just move them to passive hydro and call it a day. Alternatively, pumice is similar to perlite in that it also improves aeration and drainage, but it's not heat treated and sterilized, so I would give it a good boil before you use it. I've actually only used pumice for outdoor plants, primarily for succulents, um, but they're great for plants that have a sandy mix like euphorbias and cacti. Um, it's heavier than perlite is, so if you're using it outdoors, it has a less chance of like flying around in the wind because they're heavier than perlite. So if you're looking for a good amendment for an outdoor plant, um, pumice is great. But I do think that generally it's more expensive, so I usually just go with perlite. So bottom line, perlite is good for drainage, aeration, and keeping plants light. Um, pumice is a good alternative for perlite if you're using it for outdoor plants or for plants that have a more sandy mix um, like your cacti and your succulents and then vermiculite is for water retention. I don't want to say that everybody should follow the same soil recipe for the same species. Um, there are definitely recommendations out there that make total sense, you know, like how they say Philodendrons need well-draining soil, they don't like to be waterlogged, they don't like to sit in water, they don't like really dense soil. Um, I find that true across the board, but I do think that environmental conditions, which are always so different, um, plays a huge factor. And what I mean by that is think of your home or your apartment or wherever, think of it as its own ecosystem. Um, we have literally taken these tropical plants from their natural habitats and we are basically forcing them to live under the conditions that we give it. 
So my ecosystem is not going to be the same as your ecosystem, as your ecosystem is not going to be the same as the next person's. So before you really start to try and understand each species, I would say what's even more important is understanding your own conditions in your home, understanding the properties of everything you're adding to your soil, understanding soil itself, all of those things will really help you take care of your plants throughout all of the growing seasons. Off the bat, I'll let you guys know that I don't have a ton of like knowledge or first-hand experience with coco core. I don't personally use it myself, but I have looked into it, so I figure I would try to answer these questions the best I can. So if you're not familiar with coco core, it comes from coconuts. Um, in the past, this part of the coconut was just kind of thrown away, people didn't know what to do with it, and I think just in the last few decades, it's become really popular in plant use. And it looks like a soil medium, but it's not. There are no nutrients in coco core, so if you're going to be using this as a primary growing medium, you'll be wanting to fertilize regularly. And I do think that in terms of fertilization, it's going to require more than just your average marfil. I think that it's going to need the nutrients similar to how you grow in hydroponics. That, unfortunately, I don't have a ton of knowledge on either. I do know that coco core has high water retention and that makes it great for things like root development. So if you're going to be adding it to your soil, that is one benefit that you could potentially get from using core. And I've also heard that pests aren't really attracted to it, so if you're having a problem with things like fungus nets, that might be a good option for you. In terms of buying coco core, I feel like a lot of people can't find them at their local nurseries because they're looking for it in bags similar to soil. But all the times that I've seen it at my local nurseries, they always come in these dehydrated bricks similar to sphagnum moss. If you do a quick Google search um, and you know, type in, when do I fertilize my plants? The popular answer is probably going to say to fertilize in the warmer months, in spring and summer. But I personally only fertilize if I see that a plant is growing or if it looks like it's going to start to push out new growth. A lot of the times over fertilization happens when you're fertilizing based on a schedule rather than letting the plant tell you what it needs. So if I have a plant that hasn't had new growth on it for a really long time, I'm not just going to pump it with fertilizer thinking that's going to like wake it up. What I would do is maybe replace the soil and give it something that's a bit more nutrient rich, like adding warm castings, or using something like Marfil, which is a soil enhancer and not a fertilizer. But for a plant that is showing signs of just steady, regular growth, you want to just follow whatever is on the packaging of the fertilizer that you're using. And if you're using things like indoor greenhouses, like I use in Exoterra, you'll notice that because you're giving it conditions that essentially promote growth, you're going to see new leaves over the fall and winter. And if you're seeing new leaves, you can keep fertilizing. It doesn't matter that it's the middle of winter. You're not going to get over fertilization if you're using it correctly. Um, just think about think about roots as a human mouth. Um, we feed ourselves to give ourselves nutrients and energy because we use it. So if a plant is growing, then the roots are able to use the nutrients that you're giving it. But if it's dormant and you're feeding it nutrients, it's just sitting there and that's when you get things like fertilizer burn. Quickly going back to worm castings. Um, it contains low levels of like the essential plant nutrients like iron and um, nitrogen. It's really rich and earthy and it just adds a bit more organic matter to your soil structure. And it's not a replacement for fertilizer, but it does provide the plants with a lot of the nutrients that it needs to push out healthy foliage and continue um, healthy growth. But I guess to answer this question simply, no, I don't fertilize less if I'm using worm castings. I basically just treat worm castings as any other amendment to my soil. Um, I know that worm castings doesn't cause things like fertilizer burn, so I'm not really worried about over-fertilization in that aspect. 
um, you really just want to be more wary of the actual fertilizer that you're using. And like I mentioned, making sure that your plant needs fertilizer at that time. And then fertilizer sprays. This is something that I haven't really talked about a lot, even on my Instagram. Um, foliar sprays are great. You can actually fertilize and give your plants nutrients through the leaf blade. Um, I don't do it all that often because I don't like the stains that it leaves on the plant sometimes, but I am a huge, huge fan of air layering, not just for like propagation purposes, but because plants can actually absorb nutrients through those air roots. So if you have plants that are currently like climbing on poles or inside of poles, you can fertilize those poles and give nutrients to your plants that way. I actually don't use that many different mixes, mainly because I'm lazy too. And when I turned 30, I just developed this new love for sleeping. So if I can do the bare minimum, I will. So the soil that I showed you how to make in the beginning, that is my base for everything. Um, philodendrons, anthuriums, begonias, cacti, succulents, um, even my orchid. They all get the same thing and then I just go ahead and add amendments later if I need to. I would say that the only soil mix that is really different is the soil mix that I use for my cacti and my succulents. Again, I'm still using the same base, um, the aeroid soil from the beginning, but I add sand and that's it. I store my soil in one of those big clear storage bins. Um, I just make sure to keep it out of direct sunlight, um, pretty much any strong grow light and heat. You want to keep it in a cool dry place and if you can give it some airflow, I usually either prop open the top of the bin or I just start like jabbing holes in the plastic bin and um, airflow is the one that's going to help prevent things like mold and fungus. Also, um, you saw in my mix that I add a good amount of horticultural charcoal. I find that adding a lot of that also helps with storage. You can also add activated charcoal as well. I've done that when I didn't have any horticultural charcoal and it worked just fine. I feel like there's a general misconception about the way that water is used in soil and while exposure to airflow plays a huge part like if you use those clear orchid pots that have slits all down the side you probably know how fast it tends to dry out but plants utilize water in the soil based on how much they can photosynthesize so without rambling too much giving your plant um, enough light and warmth so that it can photosynthesize is your best bet at preventing root rot and making sure that you're not keeping it in like a very cool, dry, dark place because it's gonna have a hard time utilizing the water in that soil. Even if you have a plant like, you know, uh, a ZZ that is notoriously popular for low light or as a low light plant, it doesn't matter that they can thrive in lower light conditions. If you're giving it a lot of water, um, and it's not able to use all that water because it's not photosynthesizing a lot or it's not exposed to a lot of light, um, you're gonna still find things like root rot happening. Something I wanted to touch on that I think is not talked about enough is the fact that you can actually get root rot from not watering enough. There's a huge correlation between, in quote, overwatering and root rot, but you can also get root rot just as easily if you're letting your plants dry out for too long. If you're not familiar with how really dry roots look like, it's similar to sphagnum moss when it's straight out of the bag. Um, it's dehydrated, it's crispy, it just breaks right apart, and at that point it's pretty much at the point of no return. No amount of water can undo the damage and you basically just have to start over rerooting if that's an option. So imagine that you have a plant that have roots that have completely dried out like that and then you're like, oh crap, I forgot to water. You go and water it and then it's just sitting in that water. Like I mentioned earlier, your roots are alive. They're utilizing everything that you're putting in the soil. So if you're giving dead roots water, it's not going to do anything with that water. It's going to sit there and it's going to make your roots turn into mush. 
My favorite potting soil would have to be Ocean Forest Potting Soil from Fox Farm. Um, this one has sphagnum peat moss, earthworm castings, bat guano, fish emulsion, and crab meal. And although it looks really dense, it's actually pretty light and aerated. Um, it's super nutrient rich and you don't really need to add a ton to it besides maybe a little bit more perlite and some bark. So if you didn't know, water roots are different than soil roots. And I'll start with just how they look to the eye. Um, you'll notice that your water roots are really thin and delicate, whereas soil roots are thicker because they're basically designed to be able to dig through soil. I'm not sure of the exact science behind this, but I know that water roots have evolved to breathe underwater and soil roots can't do the same, which is why sometimes you find that um, if you're moving a plant that's been in soil into water, it tends to suffocate and rot. And it kind of works the other way around too. When you move a um, plant that was propagated in water into soil, those water roots that are basically evolved to live underwater um, suffocates in the soil. So my suggestion would be to use water propagation if you tend to use hydroponics or passive hydroponics, um, like if you're going to be growing it in Lekka or Lechuza Pond. Water propagation, in my opinion, is a great option. I've had high success rate doing water propagation to passive hydro. And then if you're gonna eventually move to soil, moss is probably your best route. I definitely tend to gravitate towards soil because that's pretty much all I've known for over a decade. Um, growing with Leca and Lechuza Pond and just passive hydro in general is sort of a newer concept for me. I've only been doing it for about two to three years now. So since I've been talking about soil for like an hour, I think answering this question will be easier if I just go into the pros and cons of LECA from my experience. So with LECA, I would say that the biggest pro is that you can see the roots. And if you've never seen LECA roots, they are unlike anything else. Um, they're super white. They're thick, they're fluffy, they're just delicious. I don't know how else to put it, but that's one huge pro. Um, another pro is that they are more pest resistant. It doesn't mean that if you grow in passive hydro or just regular hydroponics that you're never gonna get any pests, but I will say that they don't hang around passive hydro plants as much as they do with soil plants. And then the last pro is that it's sustainable. Um, it lasts a really long time. You just keep sterilizing it and reusing it and you don't have to keep rebuying it. And then I would say that the biggest con is that you can't really grow really large plants, at least not easily. And if you did, it would require so much LECA. It would be so heavy and hard to move around. Um, so that's one thing. And then I would say that all of the plants that I've grown in Passive Hydro, I haven't really noticed like really robust leaf growth. Um, but I know that a huge part of that is that I haven't really studied the proper fertilization behind growing in hydroponics. I know that it's different than soil. So that, yeah, that plays a really huge factor too. But I just noticed that my plants get so much bigger when it's grown in soil. I'm going to answer this question assuming that the plants that need to be taken care of are in soil. What I do when I'm traveling back to California is I move all of my soil plants out of really warm areas. So all of the plants that are sitting directly in like a really hot windowsill, plants that are like directly under a grow light, um, these are the ones that are going to dry out the fastest. So your best bet is getting it into a slightly cooler place so that that soil isn't drying out um, as fast. And also, I don't use terracotta pots anymore, but when I did, I made sure to get all of those plants into plastic since it's not porous. So that's another way that you can sort of stretch your watering out. Um, utilizing pebble trays or humidity trays and watering spikes are really great for larger plants 
even just using like a water bottle that's upside down i've done that before on like a big monstera and a big um euphorbia and yeah essentially just getting your plants in a cooler place doing a big drink right before um not to the point of excess but you know you just want to make sure that you're letting it get enough water while you're gone and if you're able to honestly ask friends um i didn't have many friends <laughs> that sounds really sad i didn't have many friends pre pandemic at least the ones that could help me with my plants i made a lot of friends during covid which has been like life-changing so i'm definitely going to be needing to ask for favors when i am able to go back to california again um so yeah just like join local communities join facebook groups and yeah just like expand your network because it's sort of like you scratch my back i'll scratch yours you know if someone does you a favor like you can return the favor back and yeah i guess that's the best advice i have for this question pudgy we've reached the end of another video is there anything you'd like to say oh that's very nice of you anything else would you like to tell everybody thank you for subscribing and thank you for watching this very long video Okay, um, before we go, we got to give them a high five and say we'll see them in the next video. Say bye, everybody. Bye. High five. Yay. Bye.